Welcome to the Musician's Toolbox. My name is Hello. Angela. Hi. <laughs> and I'm Andrew. <laughs> and uh, we are your hosts. We're here because we think it's really important for musicians to have better tools to be able to achieve the goals that they have. This podcast is intended for musicians of all types, whether you are an amateur or a pro, um, if you are young or older, there are always going to be things that I promise you will be helpful to you. Um, I know that I come away thinking, oh my gosh, I can totally do this different next time that I want to approach this piece. And I also think that in life, uh, one of the reasons that music is so awesome for us is that it doesn't apply just to music. It also applies to our whole lives. So um, so we're so glad that you've joined us for this episode, and Andrew's going to introduce our guest. Yes, and we have had this guest on before, <laughs> but to our dismay, the audio is not good, so we're doing another interview. Um, and in case you didn't hear or you don't know who Kimberly Dodge Dre is, I will tell you about her. She studied at BYU, and then she took a hiatus from music. It kind of sounds funny to, to begin with that, but anyways. Um, she is an advocate um, for passionate music making, and we'll probably talk about that in the interview. Um, I don't know if she would call this as cured, but it'd be interesting to see how she describes it. But she cured a Meniere's disease with music, which kind of sounds a little... If you know anything <laughs> about Meniere's disease, yeah. you'll, you'll it understand. It will be interesting uh, to hear about that. And then after her hiatus from music, she flew to New York for lessons with a teacher from the Manus School of Music. And she's just a wonderful performer, and we are so glad you are here. Thank you. <laughs> it is such an honor to be here. And I just love what you said about um, music being reflective of our whole lives. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I mean, that's the power of music is that it's, a, it's not just an activity that, you know, you, you kind of do for fun. It, it's an activity that informs all of your living, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and also helps all of your living so yeah well sure. i know as I a teacher like right yeah i know i know as a teacher it's really important to me that my students learn good skills not because i want them to be great violinists but because i want them to be great humans mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. I, I being a good violinist or violist is a byproduct of that yeah. hopefully mm -hmm. that's that's my goal with my students so mm -hmm. yeah well you don't become a very happy human um by doing something outside of yourself. It's usually, you know, the happy human part comes from within. Right. And mm -hmm. so um, if you're not getting that from music, then, you know, you're really missing out on the best part. Definitely. Yeah. So we want to dive into a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about how you began playing violin and kind of what your journey has been? You can just give us cliff notes in certain spots or whatever yeah, you think is most important uh, about your... You know, I, I was the oldest of 12 children, so the fact that I had violin lessons at all <laughs> it was very kind of impressive. a miracle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and we lived in, you know, Twin Falls, where you guys are, and at that time, there was only one violin teacher in town, and, um, you know, I, I guess in that way, I was very fortunate because, you know, people who live in mm -hmm. tiny towns don't always have the opportunity to study such a um, unique instrument, a string instrument which I think really is mostly reserved to sort of elite circles, to be mm -hmm. quite honest, it's expensive. Um, so anyway, I loved the violin, I loved to play, um, but I never considered myself in a position to ever, you know, think of it as a career or anything like that. It was just something that I loved to do. And my father, my last year of high school, was trying to figure out how he was gonna pay for college and I got into a great college, but to BYU, but he was like, well, couldn't you get a scholarship? And I'm like, dad, that's for really good people. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he was like, well, you, you know, you got second place in state solo competition and you went to all Northwest and you, you know, you practice four hours a day. That's got to be kind of good. And, yeah. gotta be good for <laughs> something. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay. So he calls and it was like two months after uh, scholarship auditions were already over. Oh, and no. he um, he talks to the um, the dean. I mean, that violin person at that time who was Nell Gutkowski. And you know, I didn't know who she was, but actually, she's listed as one of the hundred greatest violinists of the 20th wow. century. Wow! So um, she was really something. And I, you know, my I didn't go to festivals. I didn't. We didn't have money for camps. I was totally clueless about this violin world. I only knew, you know, my music, and I I liked that. 
So I went and she listened to me play two months after scholarship auditions and she was so nice and she just, hmm. she was short and she took my face in her hands and she said, you have a gift from God and I'll do everything I can to help you, hmm. um, you know, realize this gift, which I thought she was just being nice to make me not feel too badly about my playing. But two weeks later, I, I learned that I had one of the highest scholarships that year wow. and um, for music. And so I went and man, I was not in the headspace for understanding this music. I'd never had theory or anything like that. Um, my piano skills were just, uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, after two years, I think I had sort of an imposter syndrome in my mind. I just kept waiting for everybody to figure out I wasn't as good as I, they thought that I was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it, all of that, and it was quite a competitive program. And I think all of that just, you know, I, I just, kind of wasn't mentally there. So I changed my major and I to English and I graduated in English actually. And I um, had, I got married and I had children, four of them. And um, I had, I started developing symptoms actually. I didn't play for, well, I, I taught kind of, but I mean, practicing really, like I didn't do that for a good 10 years. And um, at the end of that 10 years, the reason I came back to it was because I had symptoms. I was falling over dizzy. I was couldn't get up. <laughs> I was um, having pressure in my ears and going deaf. And when we found out what was going on with me, it's called Meniere's disease. And that means that you are going deaf and losing your balance. I mean, your ears are dying eventually. Um, that doesn't happen all at once for some people. And really, it depends on your attacks. So at first I was having a lot of attacks and I went on a really long kind of health journey. Um, part of that health journey included saying to myself, I mean, when you're told that you are going to go deaf, uh, all of a sudden music becomes a lot more important to you. And mm -hmm. you see it, you, you know, you see it from a different set of eyes. And for me, rather than being this competitive thing, then it was just like, I just want to enjoy my ears while I have them. Mm -hmm. And um, part of that meant I went back to violin playing and I was, you know, really adamant that I was going to have lessons. So I started having lessons and I started practicing. Um, it, I'm not going to say it was an overnight thing, but after about seven years of doing that and getting my hours really back up, I was in full remission and I've been in wow. remission ever since. And so there's no like medical explanation for this. All I know is anecdotal. And I'm saying that as long as I practice, you know, pretty consistently, I'm in remission. Wow. And so the practicing has some correlation. And I tend to say, well, you know, I went deaf because I wasn't listening to myself and I needed hmm. music. Wow. How, so, do you know of any other cases where something similar has happened to someone who's been used to this? You know, I, I haven't really done a lot of research about that, although I did hear from someone who was seeing a renowned specialist in Meniere's disease in San Francisco, that he's actually been doing some um, experiments with music related to Meniere's disease. So I know that there is some sort of correlation. Mm. I just, mm. I haven't done a lot of research on, you know, what it is or well, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> also, you know, if you think of how many people are actually musicians and then how many people get this disease, it's, there might not be as many to be able to have. I was just curious if yeah, so yeah, yeah. Be I, interesting. Think I would love, I would love to hear what that is. It would be really right. interesting to hear. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's those, there's also those videos of like the people with dementia and um, all of the, the mind thing diseases where when they hear music they like rem like recall sure. lots of things that they don't. Yeah, that's they very different be than to. being but, cured. From yeah. Oh, I think I mean there's a whole <laughs> there's a whole field of music and therapy, I yeah. love yeah. the musical therapy. Um, and I hope that the medical community will continue to mm -hmm. do more um, investigation because I feel like it's a brave new world mm -hmm. and it's something that definitely is, you know, going to be part of our healing, um, you know, the healing uh, tools that we have. And mm -hmm. I hope that more people will look at music as being a viable, you know, healing tool. <laughs> yeah. So... I know that I've, I, I'm pretty sure I told you this at some point, but last time that we spoke, what you talked about really resonated with me because I actually had a somewhat similar experience 
at the same college as you did when I started being, you know, like come from the small town. And I, I did go to a couple camps in the summertime, but it wasn't the ones that really prepare you. Yeah, it's not you. Meadow Mount. It's not no. Lombard or, yeah. And, I and I know those things existed. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I actually knew some of them did, but we didn't have money for it. So, yeah, you know, and, and yeah. I didn't think I was good enough anyway. So, but mm-hmm. the, even to the point where like I couldn't, I didn't go and take the live auditions, but my uncle happened to work in the fine arts and communication building on the communication mm-hmm. side. And so instead of mailing in an audition, he went and hand delivered my audition, but they had the dates wrong on the website and he was uh, late because they hadn't updated uh, the dates. Mm. And so they were like, well, I guess we'll look at it because it's our fault. But they'd already accepted all the people they wanted into their studios. They'd already done the scholarships, you know, same story. And then they still accepted me and they still gave, I don't think it was the highest scholarship, but they still gave me a scholarship. So it was just, and the imposter syndrome and all of it, all of yep. it, like, I, 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 it feels like it would, it just felt like you were like speaking to me. So mm-hmm. it's, um, Uh, It kind of leads into our next question because I know that that imposter syndrome is partially because if you've never been around where there's a lot of people doing the same thing that you do or playing the same piece, it can be incredibly overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, And and then when you get put in that situation where, you know, at home, the only other violinists you were playing with were in your studio and you had a pretty good idea of how everyone played. And now all of a sudden you're around everyone who was the best in their studio or was this, and it's really hard not to compare yourself to other people. Mm-hmm. So um, can, can you talk to us about how, how you've um, dealt with that, that, that temptation to, to compare and how, how you can get over that as a musician? Well, um, man, I think I still struggle with it. Mm-hmm. I know I do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, it's an incredible temptation and part of it is good because we want to know, we want to know how to be better. And so others really are great inspirations for us. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, sometimes we think, Oh, if I could only have that vibrato or I love her tone or I love this. Mm-hmm. Right. And so some of that comparison is coming from a good place that will help us improve. But uh, most of it <laughs> is terrible because, um, you can talk yourself out of something that really brings you a lot of joy. And um, I'll say a couple things. So the first is I remember um, being asked by Aaron Roseanne to go to attend Summit um, in the summer. This was the first big festival I'd ever been to, but I was already married with four children. Mm. (laughs) I was, you know, I was older. I was older, older. But he'd heard me play in a master class and he himself invited me. And I thought, you know, sometimes these doors open and you have to know, like they open and you either walk through or the door closes and that's Mm -hmm. it. So I was going to walk through that door. And I remember him writing me a letter before I came and saying, and he said, you know, all of my students are between the ages of 15 and 25. Is that going to be a problem for you? (laughs) And I remember just thinking about it. And I just wrote him back and said, you know, if this were about ego, I would have been done a long time ago. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a good answer. uh, You know, and, and I'm, I will forever be grateful that I had that opportunity for a few lessons to study with such a master. Um, I, was I the best? No, I was probably the worst. Hmm. (laughs) You know, if you really believe in it, if you love to do it, you have to be prepared to be the worst sometimes. And I just comfort myself by saying, Oh, well, if you're the worst, then you're doing everyone else a service because then they don't have to be the worst. So, <laughs> so I think I, like I, I provide a very important service. <laughs> um, and besides, like, it's kind of silly to compare yourself that way anyway, because the worst at what? Everybody has their own unique, you know, talents and abilities, certain people you know, struggle with tone and other people struggle with vibrato and other people struggle with intonation. And I think we all struggle with intonation. (laughs) I'll never forget, like at that same camp, it was so funny because um, I listened to uh, Mr. Rosanda was walking with him and he um, passed a colleague and the colleague said, well, I think you mentioned the colleague, how are you doing, you know? And he said, 
oh, still as out of tune as ever. And they, all, <laughs> they just laugh at each other. And I thought that was such a wonderful um, kind of example for me because it's true. We never really get to a point where we're going to feel like we're completely the best. Here's another example. Um, my favorite story, and this is actually on my Instagram, but I will try to post it again or um, in any case, it's my favorite story. It comes from a book called The Accompanist written by um, Andre Benoit. And Andre Benoit was probably the leading accompanist of his day during golden age um, violin playing. And he, he accompanied Yasha Heifetz. In fact, he was mm. Yasha Heifetz's first accompanist, but his favorite person to accompany was Albert Spalding. And there's a very famous story that he put in that book where they were traveling on a train and Fritz Chrysler was just dejected. And he was so uncharacteristically dejected that Albert Spalding finally said to him, you know, what's wrong? And he said, I just think I shouldn't ever play again. I, I really think I'm going to close the case and never play this again. Hmm. Well, why is that? Well, I was just in Russia and I, you know, heard this. And, and Albert Spalding said, oh, you've heard the young Heifetz. Mm. And he said, yes. And I feel like after that, what is there? Why should I even go on playing? And Albert Spalding's response was something like, well, I don't think that because, you know, there's a Heifetz that there shouldn't be a Chrysler. He basically said, look, I'm going to go on playing because I love the violin and I don't want that joy to be gone from my life. And, you know, who's to say who's better at what, you know, you, you may reach somebody that Heifetz doesn't reach. So it was a I, I didn't say it as well as Spalding did, but it's a very beautiful quotation. And th that's basically the gist of it. He just said, look, I think you should, you know, go on playing because you love it. And thank heavens he did, because we wouldn't have Preludium and Allegro or, you know, like, yeah, so much other, repertoire. You know, incredible yeah. repertoire. Yeah. What would we do with Alfred Chrysler? Yeah. And I think you kind of need to look at yourself that way too. What would we do without your gift? What are you going to give? And you need to give your best. Um, and I, I have one other friend who said this wonderful thing that I <clears throat> always remember. She said, you know, I found that I could get very good at the violin if I just kept going. Mm. There are a lot of people who quit along the way because it tests your, you know, your must yeah. And she just said, I found that I could get very good at the violin if I just kept going. And I absolutely believe in that. Um, you know, the people that you see who are the phenoms and the stars, they didn't get there by accident. That is eight, 10 hours a day for mm -hmm. years. And it's a, it is a complete commitment. They won't talk about it, but I know. <laughs> that's Absolutely. really what it is yeah well and i like at the very beginning you said that um when you hear someone and you start comparing oh i really love their vibrato i really love their tone that's when it's a positive thing because mm -hmm. you, you learn from that how are you supposed to get better at making a good tone mm -hmm. on your instrument if you never hear something that's different from yours that you like better how are you supposed to change your vibrato if you never hear it or never see it and so I think, like you said, there can be positive aspects to it, but it becomes negative when the self-talk turns mm. the switch and says, you're not good enough, or your version of vibrato isn't worthy of this piece, or th those mm -hmm. kinds of things. That's when, that's when the, the switch flips, and that's when it becomes negative. Yeah, well, it, you know, <laughs> you have to keep coming back to the deeper yes. Mm. And that has to be so strong in you because there's every reason in the world. I mean, you can ask my friends, like on a pretty regular basis. And my husband, he's like, okay, you're giving a recital. So therefore here's the process. And we will definitely get to the point where you're like, I should just give up now. And I should do this recital. <laughs> and he knows. He knows the formula. <laughs> what happened? And then even worse is after we record it, he knows like, you are not allowed to listen to this for at least a month. <laughs> because we know too this, close. Is, this is part of the deal. <laughs> I wish, I mean, I'm just going to be just completely honest because I hope that more people will be because more, more than anything, I want you to know you're not alone. 
Mm-hmm. And you know, this is like normal. <laughs> it, it's normal. And this is, you know, I think that a lot of performers are so careful and I don't blame them because they've got these careers and agents and all this. I think I'm really lucky that I don't have an agent <laughs> because it allows me to be so real and to be the me mm-hmm. that I actually am. And I don't, cause I just think, well, you know, what's the worst that could happen? they could not give me the career I already don't have. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I do have a career, but it's, you know, it's really self-made and I kind of enjoy the freedom of that, to be quite honest. And, um, and part of the freedom of that is for me to be able to say, look, you're going to come up against these moments where you really do not want to do this anymore. And you think it's pointless and you listen to a mistake that you made And even though it's funny, because even though 10 years ago, that mistake wouldn't have made any difference to you at all. Now that mistake grates on you like you can't believe and you will have nightmares about it or you will beat yourself up overnight, you know, and you have to have some um, strategies, which I think is why you guys are doing this is to have to build some strategies for people so they can dig themselves out of that stuff because it will only stop you. And the truth is, um, as dark as your darkest moment, right around the corner, it's right around the corner is Mm -hmm. your breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And you wanna hang on so that you can have those breakthrough moments. And then you wanna be able to look at your progress and say, am I the best violinist there ever was? No, but what did I gain here? What did I achieve? Who did I touch? And um, you're gonna have moments like, just beautiful ones. Like I have this one girl uh, who came to a concert that I played with an orchestra. I played the Lark Ascending. Um, Now I never want to hear that recording ever, (laughs) never. But she recorded on on her phone. Uh. (laughs) And she tells me that she still listens to it from time to time Mm. because it was so meaningful Mm. that that performance, would I be so arrogant to take that away from her, the experience Mm -hmm. that she had when I was playing, because I myself thought it wasn't good enough. I think we really do a disservice to our audiences when we're arrogant and snotty that way. And I think that even if it's not the best, our our best is still capable of more than we know. And we shouldn't be so selfish to require um, everybody else to have our ears. Well, um, I, how do we know? <laughs> yeah, but I also think that kind of touches on this uh, misconception of the difference between humility and humiliating mm-hmm. that at yeah. least I know I as a musician have dealt with where it's really, we're not really taught how to take compliments with graciousness mm-hmm. because if we say, oh, thanks, yeah, I know it was good. <laughs> well, then people are like, well, wow, that is kind of off-putting and mm-hmm. you're kind of full of yourself. But but then what else can you say? Because well, it I know, in, I mean, you know. it's such an awkward thing, isn't yeah. it? I mean, what people, what people say to you after concerts, and I mean, <laughs> it, it is very interesting. And I finally, yes. you know, like learned after a while because people really like to talk to you after a concert about their, you know. How it relates to or them. Or their, their, you know, they want to talk to you about um, their their nephew or their cousin who plays and it's really good and they you know play at some university or something and and you think to yourself I just like like poured my heart out for you and I worked like a dog for about an hour and the thing you really want to talk to me about is your niece you know but then I realized um I mean (laughs) but that's kind of a silly way to take it because you really need to learn how you know what people are actually doing is they're trying to connect with you Right. And people are so awkward. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. awkward. I make all <laughs> kinds of mistakes. And if I can't be gracious with others, then, you know, um, that puts a hamper on me being gracious with myself. And um, mm-hmm. I'm definitely not gracious with myself. <laughs> and I'm trying to learn that in my older years because it really adds to the stress. You don't want that. So <clears throat> I guess to answer your to, to your point is that um, it's really good for your career and for yourself. If you learn how to build other people, 
Um, so when they do come to you and give you a compliment, that you remember that it's not about you. The moment that you step on stage, it's not about you anymore. It, it's not about you, it's about them. And so uh, when they come and they give you compliments or they talk to you, it's so helpful to remember, this is not about me right now. How can I give the most to this person? And really in that moment, the way that you can give the most to that person is to acknowledge them and to say, thank you so much. That means so much to me that you would say such nice things to me. Right. You know, because, um, and you leave it in that that. way. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say anything else. Yeah. 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 You don't have to say, Oh, I was just so disappointed in that performance or, Oh, you know, how could you like that? It was awful. Um, I've done that too before and it's rude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's not the way I want to go, you know, in the future. And I think um, being gracious is such a good skill and will help you in your career really well. That's so interesting to me because uh-huh. um, I, I've heard you live and your performance was super inspiring for me. And, oh. and, and you said, you said that Maybe you weren't the best, you, maybe you were the worst student in that studio or whatever, (laughs) but it doesn't matter because so many people are inspired by your music. It doesn't matter if you're the best or it doesn't matter if you're the worst because it's, it's the impact that you have on others. Yeah. I think we get way too used to performing for the, you know, magicians. We're magicians who are performing for magicians and that's silly because (laughs) Mm -hmm. to be honest, unless you are you know, a really unique and rare musician, for the most part, our, our colleagues are not the ones buying the tickets. And that's the really sad thing, because don't we want to expand our audience, the people who are listening to classical music? And didn't we believe in the music that we were playing? Like, this is amazing music, and everyone's gonna love this. Mm-hmm. Like, cause you love it. So mm-hmm. like, of course they're gonna love it, but we, for some reason, think that it's not a worthy gift unless it is a Heifetz gift. And um, we hear all of the like details and the shifts and the bow changes. And guess what? Like nine out of 10 people don't hear that, Mm -hmm. nor do they know that it's not supposed to be there, Mm -hmm. nor do they care. Mm -hmm. They just think it's amazing to see you do this left hand pizzicato. They don't even know what it is. They're like, Mm -hmm. what is that plucky sound? And how is it happening? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, they'll they'll hear some beautiful vibrato and they'll just be like, wow. <laughs> and um, so there's all these things that we spend years and years and years and years perfecting that is really attractive and fun for other people to listen to. And um, we're being rather selfish if we uh, say to ourselves, and I've been selfish like this too, this is why I know, <laughs> where <laughs> yeah. I just say, it's just not good enough. It's not up to my standard. Well, then you're then you're making it about you again. Mm-hmm. And it's not about you. Mm-hmm. The moment you step on the stage, you have to remember this music, if you have been blessed and given the resources to even study it, I mean, you are among the rarest of the rare, the most privileged of the privileged on this earth. Mm-hmm. And if you have that skill and ability for you to just say, mm, well, it's not up to my standard. Oh, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> it's not, in my view, I mean, I, 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 I hesitate saying this stuff because um, I've been trained and taught um, by very incredible artistic musicians who have this mindset. And to a degree, this mindset is important because it helps you keep reaching and getting better and having a higher standard. And there's nothing wrong with having a high standard. But I think that when it comes to performing, it's a different art. And we really need to be um, outward focused. We need to think about our audiences and that's how we grow them. Well, I also think that something that's easy to forget in music is that the interpretation of a piece is not objective. It is 100% subjective. And this is especially noticeable if you were to go and listen to recordings through an entire century Mm -hmm. of the same piece. The practices, performative practices of a piece 50 years Mm -hmm. ago are so different than they are today. And so even the way you play it in comparison to someone else on the same day, 
you know, who's to say what's perfect? It's it's 100 percent subjective. And so I, I think that it's really important to remember that um, from multiple points of view, comparing yourself to others, having your own standard of perfection, etc. So, well, there's the there's the difficulty of competitions right there that yeah. you got yeah. into because, mm-hmm. you know, um, I used to volunteer as part mm-hmm. of an organization in Minnesota, and I would get to hear this major competition every year, and um, from the preliminaries all the way through the finals and everything. And one thing I started to notice over the years, um, and I could tell there were certain things that would set certain performances apart, but here's what I know about competitions. The person who wins really, really does deserve to win. They do. Mm -hmm. They put in the work and they deserve to win. And the person who didn't win, who put in lots of time, also deserves to win. (laughs) And I started to see that like, how do you how do you judge this competition? Mm-hmm. How, I mean, I never wanted to. I I never want to be a competition judge. Um, I I started turning people down when they would you know ask for festival mm-hmm. judges and things, um, just because I don't think I I couldn't be I couldn't do it <laughs> honestly because I just felt like they all have some you know unique and redeeming quality and would I ever want to be a part of discouraging anyone from Mm -hmm. continuing no so if i have a competition a kimberly dre competition would be like everybody wins (laughs) and i'll make you all cookies afterwards Uh. (laughs) and um to me like there is no lose like when did we make you know losing a possibility with music Mm. it's Mm. like antithetical to Mm -hmm. everything that music is (laughs) and in fact i'm just gonna say this one little quotation that i wrote down uh, apparently, this is from Pythagoras. He says, the highest goal of music is to connect one's soul to their divine nature, not to entertainment. Oh. And um, if that's what we're about, is connecting other people to their own divine center, then we really ought to be connected to ours. And that has nothing to do with, you know, being good enough. That's silly. Mm-hmm. You're good enough by virtue of the fact that you're on the planet. Now, obviously, there's, you know, levels. <laughs> And you're going to improve and you want to improve, but, um, your value is not at stake. <laughs> yeah. Your value is never at stake. And that's, that's the part that I get a little bit, um, that I think can go wrong Yeah. in competition for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I would like to pivot just a little bit, um, and talk about, we kind of talked about how you got into music, but mm-hmm. I mean, it's kind of changed recently because of your hand injury. But what what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing now with your music? And yeah, we just talked about that. How long are well, your fingers going to be injured? Yeah, yeah. Let's start with that. How long? Are you- <laughs> um, I think so far we think it's a month. Um, I have to change the dressings three times a day, and um, it looks like I mean these two fingers especially are very very blistered. Um, my first finger seems like it's going to be just fine. Okay. And my pinky is going to probably escape, but these two are not great. And it, no. so it really depends on how well I'm doing keeping, keeping them, you know, bandaged. And hopefully if I do a really good job, then I'll be fine. And there won't be any complications past a month. Um, how did it happen? If you don't mind me asking. <laughs> or if you don't want to it tell, was, that's fine. It was a very stupid cooking accident. I was oh my ham gosh out of a <sighs> crock pot and no uh, yeah boiling water and that ham hock is very slippery so oh. it was oh just a gosh. stupid stupid accident <sighs> um anyway <laughs> i'm so, so sorry that's, that's horrible <laughs> yeah uh, we're sending that, prayers your was, way <laughs> uh, before that i was working on this really heavy duty recital a french recital and it was um the ravel sonata number one the i mean no, sorry the ravel sonata the blues so number two the blues sonata um chasson poem then um, some uh, Lily Boulanger pieces and a, a, a couple uh, WC transcriptions and things, and then um, Yankee Doodle by Vuitton. So um, it was That's a really, cool. um, yeah, girl with the flaxen hair, uh, <laughs> of course. <you> know? <laughs> so, um, so I was working on that, and I was really on schedule, and I was supposed to perform in February. Mm. but um October 17th I got this awful sickness um like 
ironically, because I had a skin infection that I was prescribed an antibiotic for and the antibiotic mm. caused this awful sickness. So oh. the funny thing is now I can't have an antibiotic in case of infection oh. here because of the other sickness. Oh no. So I have to be extra careful. I know it's ironic. Oh. In any case, yes, that's what I was working on. Okay. So what <laughs> am I working on for the future? Well, so what can I still do? I can still, um, I can still, uh, compose. So mm -hmm. I've had these pieces that have been on the back burner because I've been working on these recital rep for a long time. And now it seems like it's the perfect opportunity to get started on my composing again. So that's what I'm going to do is, um, work on, and I'm actually working on a piano piece. So Andrew, I'll send it your way when oh, I'm done. Cool. I'm so excited <laughs> to see it. Uh, so cool. I'll be working on that. Um, I think that maybe it's fortuitous that we had this interview in the middle of my injury, because I think there are a lot of injured violinists um, mm -hmm. who become extremely discouraged because of sickness or injury, um, illness. And um, yeah, I'm just going to be real about it. I think that so many in this career are mum, completely silent if there's mm -hmm. ever, and they're even so careful that they won't, you know, talk to you about it unless it's on the phone and they won't, you know, own up. Mm -hmm because it's so detrimental to careers, I, I guess. Um, but I'd rather be real and be mm -hmm. honest about it and say, you're a human being. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be some times when you have to, you know, um, see an injury through, when you're going to have to see a sickness through, when you're going to have times in your life when, you know, you have to deal with the human that you are. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity at this time to say, okay, well, things didn't go my way, mm -hmm. but we have to be resilient in life. You can't just, you know, um, I guess you can, I did for 10 years. I didn't fight. And, um, that was a really bleak 10 years. I don't want to go back there. So, um, having had that experience and knowing what it's like to be told that you're going to lose it all mm -hmm. kind of helps your fight. Mm -hmm. Um, how much do you love it? Are you really mm -hmm. going to let it go for that? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that does in the long term help you when you have these moments of, gee, what's going on with my career right now to say, well, I don't know, because right now I'm learning something new. I'm learning some new skill. I'm learning some new thing. And you never know when that's going to help you out. Um, during that 10 years, for instance, that I was not playing the violin, I actually had a business. And I sold handbags nationwide wow. and well in like high end boutiques um, all over the country. And it was a great experience for me. I learned a lot about business and I've used a lot of what I learned um, from that business experience in building a career. So um, just because you have a moment that isn't going quite like you want it to, like have some faith, know that <laughs> that process is part of your overall development as a human as and as a better musician and i almost always find that that i that is cool to me how you just like i mean i follow you on instagram and it <laughs> seemed like you had just showed your your hand being injured and then you're like yeah and i'm gonna use this to do this i mean you you weren't mm -hmm. like oh, I can never play the violin again. And I mean, and you didn't, you weren't like... Oh, believe me, the first, <laughs> the first thing out of my mouth when the doctor looked at it and said, these are second and third degree burns, I was like, am I going to play again? That yeah. was the first thing. So yeah. yes, I, well, I mean, I am human. <laughs> yeah, but, but what I think is really cool is that you weren't just like, you just, you didn't just give up. You, you pivoted and you kind of, you kind of changed the direction of where you were taking your music career. And I mean, I think that's applicable for freelance musicians on March, whatever the day was when events got canceled and some people pivoted and some people didn't. And yeah. Some people moved home. So, <laughs> which is, <laughs> I'm just teasing. I think that's okay. But see, that's just the thing is that um, I think that 2020 is a great year because it's teaching us resilience, right? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. teaching us how to be innovative. It's teaching mm -hmm. us how to, and there have been some amazing mm -hmm. like stories. I've seen some people that um, 
Project Music Heals Us is a really good example. They, um, they're a quartet and they, they used to be play a lot for, um, you know, I think um, nursing homes and they played, um, they had grants and stuff and they would play for um, uh, prisons and those kind of people. And obviously that kind of had to shut down even. Mm. And uh, they pivoted and now they play for COVID patients, like one-on-one -on -one mm. concerts. Talk wow. about music therapy. I'm yeah. super, super um, inspired by that. And I have another friend, Sarah Whitney, who started doing these small mini concert series. So it was like socially distanced and it was only a few people. So it was just a smaller audience size and a smaller concert structure. But um, I just, I think, and in fact, the, um, the venue in my town, they learned very quickly how to figure out streaming. And so they could continue their concerts. Um, just, it's just a streaming platform now. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I definitely, you know, you gotta be scrappy, man. Yeah. There's <laughs> almost everybody that I know who's making it in this, um, you know, except the very, very, very top echelon, um, or if you have an orchestra job. Um, and even then, um, most of the people that I know are doing several things. You know, they are teaching, they are playing in gigs, they're doing studio work, they're playing in orchestras, they're, um, you know, doing podcasts. They're, there's, you know, this is kind of one of those jobs that requires innovation, mm -hmm. creativity, but then you know, you, you got into a creative field. What were you expecting? Like, yeah. to be not creative? <laughs> what did you really want? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We want to be respectful of your time and um, no, it's don't, great. don't want to take too much time, but we have two final questions that we want to great. ask you. Um, I always find it interesting to ask people who have a high level of expertise and achievement. Um, and achievement in their life, what they consider to be their greatest accomplishment. And it doesn't have to oh. be music related, just in general. It, it's a good perspective gaming question, I think. Well, I'm in the middle of raising my fourth teenager. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I just want to say, because I have experience, mm -hmm. that raising teenagers is so much harder than playing Paganini. Like, <laughs> so much harder. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry, but I've done them both. And so <laughs> anybody, anybody who's raised a teenager is going to agree with me who's played Paganini. So, um, you know, I feel like getting through the teenagers, and the funny thing is, is that you don't really raise them, they raise you. So you get to the end of it and you don't even feel like, you know, you accomplish anything, but you know, I, I have some pretty fabulous children. I don't brag about them very much because I try to keep that part of my life a little bit more private, but, um, but I'm super, super mm. proud of my children. And, um, and I'm glad I know that I could have reached higher levels of this art form. Had I made choices to put them second and to a certain degree, I really have I've asked a lot of them. I, I can't even imagine how terrible it was for them when I was doing my Isai phase. I mean, that <laughs> had to be painful listening to that every day. <laughs> but but um, in general, um, I've had to take weeks and months off of violin playing for my children's sake before mm. because they really needed me or because they were in a bind or because we were just going through a teenage phase and mm -hmm. they required my care. And um, for me personally, I'm glad that I made the decision to do that. Um, it was worth it. And yeah, that's probably my, my favorite accomplishment that and I don't know, just getting up every day and continuing to decide to play. I think it's an everyday choice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I hope that I'll keep choosing it even when I'm old and gray. <laughs> that's super Thank cool. Thank you. And finally, what are some, this might be something that we've talked about, but what are some tools that you would recommend people to put in their toolbox, musicians? Um, I think I kind of touched on it just recently by saying that um, developing other skills sometimes is just as important for your music career as the music itself. Um, we like to be this artist who does nothing except practice all day. And that is a reality for people very few people who even even people who have an agent that's not even really their reality um 
most of us have to take care of a lot of things and almost all of us are entrepreneurs to a certain extent. The number of people for whom it is a reality that they think of nothing but music is incredibly slim. And most of them are under the age of 18 who have parents, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Who are taking care of all of that stuff for them. So that um, phase of your life is, is limited. And after that, you know, you really have to grow up and take care of a lot of different things. Um, I know, for instance, that there have been recital series that I have um, applied for in which my English degree has come in incredible handy because mm -hmm. um, I have seen them before. You, when you have a recital series, a lot of times you will have to fill out an application and that application will include things like, um, you know, your program and your program notes and sometimes your education and a lot of your background those kinds of things. If you can't spell correctly, or if your punctuation is all over the place, um, or if you're, I mean, you just want a professional look. And unfortunately, you may be a very great musician who doesn't get an opportunity because you have other skills that aren't up to snuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing like headshots, they're important. You need to get a good headshot. It's part of being a professional. And, um, you know, some, some people have great photography skills and that comes in incredible handy when you're on Instagram and that is a photography based marketing platform. Mm -hmm. So um, if you've got photography skills, then you're doing really well on Instagram because it, it caters to that particular skill. Um, another skill would be, you know, uh, producing. Oh man, I am terrible with that aspect. I, I would give anything to have the recording skill. There are so many people who right now are putting out music and recordings um, just from their like little home, um, you know, just from a room like this. I think that's incredible. Um, you know, you can sell so many things and not only that, but have great things to show for yourself on your, um, on your website if you, if you have that skill. So there are a lot, a lot of skills that are very valuable and I would just, say, hey, play to your strengths. If you have other skills, other abilities, yeah, that's really important for musicians. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for it's, making time for oh, me it's, it's such, yeah. You guys are so much fun to talk to. And I really am <laughs> like so wise. grateful that you had me back again after that garbled mess of our Yes. <laughs> What a great interview. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And we truly hope that you have found some tools to put in your toolbox. Our podcast, as a reminder, can be found on various platforms as well as on YouTube. Once again, feel free to send us a DM or voice message with anything that you'd like to see in the future. Um, we often post announcements and upcoming guests on our social media. So if that's interesting to you, you should go and give us a follow. Yeah, we would love some follows. And lastly, while we do love doing this for free, podcasting is not free. So if you really like what we're doing and have uh, gained some value from our show, there are a few ways that you can support us. You could share with your friends. You could rate and review. And subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You could also shop our merch, uh, which you might have seen in our YouTube videos, or become a supporter through a donation at the Anchor Podcast link in the show notes below. Thanks for watching. See you later.